Hello, I want to thank you for joining us here on this beautiful Sunday morning. And uh, so excited about the, the Bible study for today. So let's just jump right into it. We're going to find Psalm number 107 for today. Psalm number 107. And uh, this psalm, the first, we'll, we'll get through just a, uh, about half of this, uh, maybe a third of it. But um, <clears throat> we, we've got these first three verses that are kind of introduction for the, for the rest of the psalm. And I uh, want to read through those here for just a moment. Psalm number 107, verse number 1, the Bible says, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Father, we thank you for, so much for your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us today. Give us wisdom as we, uh, as we study your word together. Lord, I pray that you would help me as I, uh, as I teach here and preach here today. Lord, I pray that you would give me your wisdom. Uh, impart to me the words that, that we need for this hour, that you would encourage our hearts, and that you would strengthen us for the days ahead. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Um, uh, give thanks unto the Lord. We have so much to be thankful for. God, in all that He's given to us and all that He's done for us. And, and the truth is, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are today. God is good. And we still have much to thank Him for. He says here in verse 2, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. He is good. It's His nature to be good. He cannot help but being good. Something we can barely fathom because our sin, our, our nature, our sin nature is to... Is, is wicked. That's what that's what we know. That's what comes naturally for us is wickedness. What comes naturally for God is goodness. It's love and it's mercy. And his mercy is not going to be outlived. God is good. We need to thank him for it. Give thanks to him for it. He is forever merciful, always withholding from us what we truly deserve. Now you think about that statement. And it's so very true. What we deserve is death in hell. And God, God is, completely, is complete merciful to us. Anything that we have that is not hell, literal hell, is God being good. Now don't talk to me about the hell that we're living through today. My friends, nothing here will ever hold a candle in comparison to what hell is. This virus, the quarantine, the none of this, the social injustices, none of it holds a candle in comparison to what hell is. So we need to be thankful. And then he tells us, say so. Tell others of God's redemption. Tell others of his goodness and of his mercy. And then there's a refrain that's repeated four different times in this psalm. And, uh, and we, see it, uh, we see it verse down here first, down here in verse number 8. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. We see it in verse 15, and uh, then we see it in verse number 21, and, uh, and then we see it in verse number 31. And so, because this refrain is repeated four different times, I, what I see here is four different types of Christian. Four different types of Christian. Now, just a historical note. Most believe that this, is, uh, that this psalm historically is referencing um, the, the, uh, a Babylonian captivity when Israel was, uh, was, a, was cap held captive by Babylon. Uh, or some, uh, or some other, uh, pick, take your pick of uh, one of the God, one of the times that God has chastened his uh, his people, and uh, put them under the uh, under the the authority of a surrounding nation, right? Um, so, but one of the times that they were held captive, and so they, and so that that's kind of historical note. And you read chapters, or excuse me, Psalms one hundred five and one hundred six. And uh, to get a little bit more uh, of context there. But we can also apply this 
passage to us today because we do have an enemy and God that God grants us victory over and so we see here four four different types of Christian today what are the four different types of Christian this is just what I see here in this passage it's four different types of Christian number one is the infant the infant Christian that new believer do you remember what it was like when you first got saved when you first came to Christ the feeling of uh, and the, the knowledge of hopelessness and helplessness. Read these first few verses. Verse number four. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. So there's the description. They're wandering and they're lonely. They have no city, they have no place to dwell where they belong. They are hungry and they are thirsty, desiring something that the world cannot satisfy. He says here they're not, he, he says here they're hungry, they're, they're thirsty, their soul faints in them. And my friend, this describes someone who has not yet come to Christ, who is on that verge of coming to Christ in salvation hungry and thirsty. Scripture tells us in Ecclesiastes that God has set eternity in the hearts of man. There is a longing, there is a, uh, there is a longing in the soul that can only be satisfied by God himself. Now man tries to satisfy the longing of the soul. We try to satisfy the longing in the soul by possessions, by, by work, uh, by obtaining things, um, by serving some purpose, some greater good. But my friends, the longing in the soul can only be satisfied by the Lord Jesus himself. That's the longing in the soul. That's the hunger. That's the thirst. And it's, and it's a desire for something that the world cannot satisfy. There is absolutely nothing else that can fill that void. Because of this, uh, an unsaved person, one who doesn't know Christ, is completely hopeless. Completely and utterly hopeless. Listen to this. Hungry, uh, they, they wandered, they're hungry, they're thirsty. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distresses. My friend, an unsaved person is distressed, utterly distressed. And then scripture tells them they cry out to God. What does God do? Verse number seven, he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. When you call upon God, God will save you. He'll save you. The leading hand of God will guide you into a place of loving care and belonging. A family. That's what church is. You know, I struggle with these online meetings that we're having right now because we're, we're only fulfilled. No, we're doing the best we can. But it doesn't fulfill everything that God asks us to do as a church together. The last time we, we could not meet it was for about eight or ten weeks I don't know how long this is going to go. Perhaps we won't be able to meet again until September, perhaps October or November. And then depending on who gets elected in November, it may extend farther than that. Trust me, I would love to be wrong on this. If I'm wrong, it would be the happiest day of my life. <laughs> huh. I don't know how long we're going to go. But I know this, when God saves someone, he gives them family. That's what church is. That's what church should be. It should give us a sense of belonging, a sense of camaraderie, communion with one another. We have, we have that to praise God for. Praise God for saving you. Praise God for bringing you into his family. 
So we see this verse number eight. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of man. The salvation of a soul is always something wonderful and absolutely amazing. It, but that's not where it, this section stops. He, he goes on to verse number nine. Oh, that verses 8 and 9, listen to it together. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of man. For he satisfies, he satisfieth the longing soul. He filleth the hungry soul with goodness. So often an unsaved person tries to fill their soul with something good, something right. And they have no hope of even discovering what is good and what is right. But God fills that void. God fills them with goodness. God fills them and satisfies them. His satisfaction, His leading in your life, His filling your life to overflowing. God is good. Do you remember that day when God reached down and saved you and filled you? Gave you purpose. Oh, my friend, if not, today can be that day of salvation for you. But then we find the next type of Christian, the next type of person, the next type of believer is an immature believer. Saved, yes, but immature. The verses 10 through 16, we see this, uh, this passage. Verse 10 says, Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. This next type of, uh, of believer is an immature one. One that sits in darkness. Now listen, when you get saved and you're, and you're on fire for God, that only lasts so long. It's kind of like an adrenaline rush. You can do some amazing things in an adrenaline rush, but the adrenaline subsides. But if you maintain a, 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 a regiment of exercise and strength and conditioning, you can do great things without the adrenaline rush. The same thing is true spiritually. Spiritually speaking, you get saved and there's kind of that rush and it's exciting and you're on fire and you're excited about it. You have a zeal and a fervor. But eventually it goes away. And for a lot of Christians, that zeal went away and they were left in darkness. They did not maintain a regiment. They did not maintain a schedule. They did not maintain spiritual conditioning. And so they sit in darkness. No leading from God. No guidance. No direction. No, no movement. Not because God's not there. Not because God's not telling them where to go. But they're in total panic mode. Something bad has happened. God's chastening them now. And now they wonder if they're even saved. They're wondering where God is. God is still in the same place. God's still in the same position. He's still there waiting for them but they don't see them. Because they, they go to Scripture and they try to, uh, to, to, to take what they, what they want from Scripture and not what God tells them to do. He says they're sitting under the shadow of death. There's no spiritual, there's no evidence of spiritual life at all. In fact, they've gotten saved and they've set God on the shelf as if to add Him to some collection of gods in their life. And that's not, not, that's not how God works. God's not interested in that. And so what do they have? They, they experience the chastening hand of God. They are bound, captive, slaved, entangled. Entangled in what? By whom? By their sin. New Testament teaching is clear on this. To, to whomever you submit yourself, you are the ser you're their servant. You're their slave. You submit yourself to sin. You are the slave of sin. 
There's no two ways about it. So they see the, the chastening hand of God. They're rebellious, verse number 11, because all of this, because they rebelled against the words of God. They tried to take the parts of God's word that they liked, that they wanted to apply, like that God is love. And, that, and yes, certainly God is love, but that's not all that God is. And that we should love one another, and certainly we should love one another, but that's not all there is to a Christian life. Certainly we should love one another. Well, that's not all that there is. Knowing God's word, but disregarding it. That's what rebellion is. The rebellion is not ignorance. Rebellion and ignorance are two different things. In rebellion, you know what the truth is. You just refuse to do it. And so they refuse to go, uh, uh, they refuse to, to accept and to apply the Word of God to their life. They've contemned the counsel of the Most High, he says in verse 11. God's counseled with them. And they've decided to go their own way. Therefore, now that's why he brought them down. Uh, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was no one that could help them. Now, my friends, you look at us as a society today because I believe you could take all four of these things and you could look at it as a society as a whole as well. A society that cries out to God and not, not even knowing who... And, and so often we hear, this, we hear this question, what about the, the jungles of people in the jungles of Africa? They've never heard about Jesus. Why, they can cry out to God. God will hear them. And God will send someone. God will save them. We as a society, we've rebelled against God. We know what's right to do. We're refusing to do it. What happens when that's the case? God will bring your heart low. God will bring your heart low with, with labor. His people specifically in the, in the historical aspect of these verses, He brings them into a place of servitude, of slavery to some other nation. God will bring down the rebellious Christian. How does he do that? Well, first of all, by conviction. Conviction of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, by physical stress. By physical distresses. And that's not to say if you're going through a difficult time physically that you're somehow under the... You're not necess, that doesn't necessarily constitute a chastening, uh, chastening from God or that you're rebellion, rebelling from God in some way. Just ask Job, right? Whose friends told him, Hey, listen, man, you're going through a hard time. What did you do to upset God? But God will use physical stresses to bring His children back to Him. Toils. Heartaches, toils, this, this idea of, of, of working, putting effort, and not yielding much fruit at all. Why do you think our society is in such a bad way? We've seen the, uh, we've seen the, the, um, the, pros the times of prosperity in this country where we hardly had to work. It seems like we hardly had to work at all. And God just blessed us and it was prosperous. We want that so badly right now. But it seems like the more that we work, the further behind we get. That's chastening. That's chastening from God. Heartaches, heartaches on every hand. Children, be, Children's lives being taken at random. By random acts of violence, it's heartache. Now, my friend, when God cuts you down, you will fall. No one can help you. Not even your pastor. Now, I can pray for you. But be careful what you ask prayer for. I've had, some, I've had folks come and, pray, and ask me to pray because their loved one had done something and it was a minor thing, but they're being punished too harshly. Pray for them. Well, let's pray that the truth will be revealed. Let's pray that the truth will come out. Let's pray that we'll have the strength to endure it. I'm not going to pray that their sentence would be lightened or, or that the, the, the consequences of their sin would just go away. 
But I've got good news for you. You can still call upon God. Verse number 13. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. And he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands in sunder. God, God's, the way that God works is just so amazing when we come to him in humility, understanding who he is, understanding who we are. And God will come to us. We cry out to him. God will come to us. He'll rescue us. He'll save us. He'll, he'll shine upon us the light of his word, the leading of his hand. And then a, 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 new, a new spiritual life is given. It, it's, not a, it's not a loss of salvation that we've experienced, but the restored joy in salvation as we, as we read about in Psalm 51 verse 12. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. That's what we see here in, in God delivering, them, delivering us out of our distresses when we're under his chastening. And then he goes in. And he breaks the bands in sunder. Freed from that, from that entrapment, that enslavement, that entanglement, that is addiction, that is sin. Oh, my friends, we have much to praise the Lord for. Praise the Lord for forgiving you. Praise the Lord for freeing you from your sin. Praise the Lord for, for freeing you from this seemingly impossible prison. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness, for His wonderful works to the children of men. We just search your heart today. And perhaps today you're here, you're listening to the message today, right now, no matter what day it is today. You're listening right now. And you're considering you don't have any kind of relationship with God. Oh, my friend, that can all change right now in this very moment. All you need to do is yield yourself to Him. Pray to Him. Call upon Him in prayer. Believing that He is who He says He is. That Jesus is the only way. That His Word is absolute truth. And that you trust Him. Completely and wholly trust Him. He'll save you. He'll forgive your sin. He will heal your heart. And then He'll get to work. And He'll change you. As you get into His Word and learn of Him and learn from Him, He'll change your heart. He'll change your life. And my friend, maybe you're here. You're listening today. You're watching today. And you're rebelling against God. There's been some area of your life where you've said, Nope, God, I've... I've done it your way and all these other things. I'm not doing it your way anymore. Oh, my friend, even you, you can yield to him today. You can submit to him today. You know the truth. You know what you should do. But you're refusing to and you're under terrible conviction. Would you call upon him? Would you humble yourself to call on him? Ask Him to help you to make the changes in your life necessary. He'll do it. He'll help you. As we see in 1 John 1, 9, He's faithful. If we, if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He'll forgive the sin and then He'll help you to live right. Oh, we have so much to be thankful for. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. That men would praise the Lord for His goodness for his wonderful works to the children of men. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, I thank you for the leading and the guidance uh, that you've had on my, my own heart and my own life that I see. And Lord, I thank you for being there for me. I thank you, Lord, for forgiving me when my life was so hopeless and I was helplessly and hopelessly lost. Lord, I thank you for hearing me when I call out to you in my own sin and my own rebellion. Lord, I pray that you would help each one here who might be struggling with some sin, some area of their life. They're not yielded to you. Oh, Father, I pray you'd help them. Yield to you. Humble themselves before you. That they would see your hand working. That they would allow you to continue to do their work. 
to do your work. Change their hearts and lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, my friends, keep your finger, keep a spot right here in Psalm number 107. Lord willing, we'll see the second, uh, second part of this uh, later on this afternoon. All right, until we meet again, God bless you. Have a great afternoon.